Hi everyone, Stepan here. Uh, today I'm going to start a series on one of the greatest chess players of all time, Tigran Petrosyan, uh, and it's going to be a part of uh, the series of covering games of seven world champions. And every Tuesday we are going to have a look at a Petrosyan game. We're going to start with his earliest games, and this is the first recorded game uh, played by Tigran Petrosyan. It was played in 1942 in a simul against the great Solomon Floor, who was uh, a great player. He was born in uh, uh, 1908, so he was already almost 50 or 40 something, or 40, excuse me. And he was a great player. He was among the first players to be awarded the GM title by FIDE in 1950 when the GM title was introduced. So a great player. And this was a simul played in Tbilisi, Georgia, uh, Petrosian's hometown. Now, Petrosian was born in 1929, so he was 13 during this game. Okay, before we get to the game, and the game is insanely good, uh, I'll give you a br brief intro on Petrosian. So, he was the world champion from 1963 to 1969, and he could have lasted longer, but he had bad luck, I would say, in the world championship matches. He was nicknamed the Iron Tiger, or the Iron Tigran, due to his uh, great defensive play and due to the inability of players to, to break his defenses. Uh, he was a candidate for the World Chess Championship on eight occasions, which is incredible, in 53, 56, 59, 62, 71, 74, 77, and 1980, which is incredible. So for 30 years he was a candidate. Uh, he won the championship in 63 against Botvinnik, and he defended it against Spassky in 66, and in 69 he lost it to Spassky, who was the world champion until 72 when Fischer defeated him. He won the Soviet championship four times and here are two quotes about Petrosian. So what is Pasky said? Uh, it is to Petrosian's advantage that his opponents never know when he is suddenly going to play like Mikhail Tal. And that's very true. People know Petrosian for his great defensive play. But when it was necessary, he played crazy tactical games. You're going to see that in this one. And Fischer said, uh, Petrosian has an incredible tactical view and a wonderful sense of, of danger, no matter how much you, uh, how deep you think. He will smell any kind of danger 20 moves before. So that, that's true about Petrosian. He could sense danger and he knew how to prepare. Now here is the most amazing uh, statistic about Petrosian. He played in 10 consecutive Soviet Olympiads from 58 to 78. And in the 10 Olympiads he won 9 gold medals one silver medal, horrible, and six individual gold medals. And his overall score was 78 wins, 50 draws, and only one defeat. And that's, I mean, if you have only one defeat out of 130 games, then you are the Iron Tiger. Okay, and Petrosian died in 80, 1984, uh, unfortunately, still kind of young. Okay, let's look at his first recorded game. So he's white against the great Salomon Floor in a simul. And as I said, Salomon Floor is already about 40. So he's basically playing a kid. In those days when you were 13, you weren't supposed to be a grandmaster yet. So it was okay to be a kid. Okay, Petrosian plays d4, uh, Floor plays knight f6, and after c4 we have the Budapest Gambit. Now Floor probably wouldn't play this in a, certain, in a tournament game, but he played a kid from Georgia, so why not? Okay, and we have d takes e, we have knight g4, which is the main move, and now instead of playing bishop f4, which is the main line, and knight c6, and knight f3, and bishop b4 check, and knight b to d2, and queen e7, and e3, or the second main move, knight f3, after which bishop c5 is played, and d3, etc. Uh, Tigran Petrosian played the move e4. Now, this has been played by Bakro, Ivanchuk, Ceparinov. It's a good move, and it's just the third most popular. And it's slightly strange, and probably Floor was put off guard by this. And the main line goes knight takes e5, uh, and after which white plays f4, knight e to c6. And you can see that white is grabbing a ton of space. Black is moving his knight around, so bishop to e3, bishop b4 check, knight d2, queen e7, bishop d3, and the line goes further and further. Instead of that, after e4, uh, Floor played a move that's only been played a couple of times since. Until then, it probably hasn't been played by strong uh, strong players. He played a move h5, and this is probably his blitz repertoire or something. So h5, attacking attacking the pawn still and defending the knight uh, instead of instead of taking on e4 straight away, on e5 straight away. 
So we have h3, which is objectively the best move. Knight takes e5. And now bishop e3 before playing f4. Knight b to c6. Knight to c3, developing his pieces. Bishop b4, pinning the knight. Queen to d2, unpinning and defending. He doesn't want doubled pawns on the c-file. d6 played, which is okay. And now f4. And Petrosian is starting his attack. Uh, floor is down in development. Uh, he doesn't have any central control. Uh, obviously, Petrosian's c4, e4, and f4 pawns control the entire board. The bishop on c8 has no good squares. The knight on c6 has no good squares. And what's obvious now, the knight on e5 has no good squares. So it, it goes to g6. Now knight f3 simply developing another piece, queen e7. This may already be imprecise, probably bishop d7 and castle's queen side was just best for black just to run away. And bishop d3, so white has developed all of his pieces, it just remains to see wh where he's going to castle. And in this position floor went a bit too far. So the move h5 weakens the g5 square and whenever you move a pawn something, something is weakened. And here he played the move f5. F5 weakens the g5 square terminally, and Petrosian should have played knight g5, simply occupying the square. Instead, he took on f5, but f5 is definitely a bad move. What he could have tried instead was knight h4, and for example, white castle's queen side. He could also castle king side, despite this, and in this position, white would just be crushing it. Okay, huge center, the pawns are actually very compact and very solid, open g-file, semi-open d-file with the queen and rook battery, great position. Okay, uh, but f5 is, is even worse, f5 is just a dreadful move, and instead of playing knight g5, Petrosian takes, and uh, we have knight takes f4, instead of bishop takes, bishop takes pawn, of course that was defended by the white bishop. Okay, and in this position Petrosian plays crazy, completely unlike him, he castles queenside. It was much better to castle kingside, that, that's just safer, and you still have a very good position. But after knight takes a4, he castled queenside, and now a ton of exchanges happen, and the problem is that the, that the bishop on e3 is hanging, so now the queen is no longer protecting the knight, and Solomon Floor has the option to double the pawns on the c-file, which could be useful, because the queen is, uh, the queen is able to get to a3. Okay, so we have bishop takes c3, of course, if queen takes, queen takes bishop check. So b takes c3, knight takes d3, another exchange, queen takes, and now bishop to d7 is played, which is just too slow. Uh, and after this, Petrosian had the chance to win the game straight away. Uh, bishop d7 should have been played instead of f5 a few moves ago. Uh, what, what Flor could have played, which could have saved the game, was bishop takes f5. And of course, it's it's not a peace sacrifice because the e3 bishop is hanging with check. So after queen f5, queen e3, king c2, and something like rook f8, queen takes h5, this should indeed be completely equal. Uh, the king can get to d7, the other rook will develop, white's pawn structure is dreadful, and probably everything it will get traded off into a draw, so he could have saved the game like that. Instead he played bishop d7, and now Petrosian had the opportunity to just crush him with bishop g5, attacking the queen, opening the e-file for the rook to come into the game with tempo, and basically forcing the king to stay in the center throughout the game. So here, let's say queen f7, rook h to e1 check, king to f8, and now simply g4, and you're going to queen your pawn, or you're going to checkmate. So th this would have been just game over. I think even a weak player like me could, could win this position. It's just so dominating. But instead, after bishop d7, uh, rook h to e1 was played straight away. And this now gave Floor the opportunity to run away and give up the exchange, which he did, which is probably a good idea, otherwise bishop g5. So he castles queen side, and of course bishop g5 wins the exchange. But after queen f7, Bishop takes rook and rook takes rook. It's, it's it sort of released the pressure in the position. White is winning, of course, uh, but it's actually a good thing for the black position that white took the exchange. Okay, g4. I'm going to queen his pawn. Knight a5, attacking the c4, uh, the c4 pawn, and now a great move, queen to d5, defense c4, because if knight takes c4, then queen takes queen. 
and if queen takes d5, then c takes d5, and the c4 pawn is not hanging anymore. So Flor had to exchange. And now, once the queens got traded off, the fact that white is an exchange up uh, means much, much more. And this is now a simple conversion, a simple technical conversion and exchange up with a much better pawn structure and and better pieces. The knight on a5 is is not a good piece. Rook f8, uh, preventing the pawns from moving forward easily. Now rook e7, simply wanting to take the pawn, g6. And now an interesting piece sacrifice, which if, if this is a slow positional defensive player, then, then he became that 20 years later when he was a kid. He was a tactical genius. So after g6, he just took fg6. And yeah, now if you take the knight, I'm just going to promote my pawn. So if, if rook takes knight, then g7, and you're not stopping my pawn anymore. So hg, he plays g7, doesn't even take the pawn, rook g8, and now he doesn't take the pawn again, he just plays rook f7, and he's going to play rook f8 and queen. Okay, bishop e8, rook f8 anyway, rook g7, he had to give up his rook, so rook takes bishop, pawn takes knight, and now again, a simple conversion and exchange up takes takes this is four against four but white has a passed pawn on h3 black's knight doesn't do anything on a5 and the rooks are just dominating the entire board so knight c4 uh, rook d to f1 knight e5 attacking the rook rook e3 rook h7 rook f4 and now it's just a matter of how quickly can you push the pawn forward basically white is preparing the advance of the h pawn and once the h pawn starts rolling then then the rook is going to be tied down to the h file the black rook and black is going to be playing an exchange and the rook down so rook b7 rook to g3 a6 h5 rook to h7 the rook has to drop back rook to g5 defending a5 rook to f6 simply preparing h6 rook b7 h6 rook to b1 trying to do something from behind but that doesn't really work rook h5 is just the final blow and now since you cannot play rook h1 you can resign floor played rook c1 check and after king d2 rook a1 h7 he gave up so as a 13 year old kid during the second world war to crush a very well known player in fact one of the first grandmasters that was an incredible achievement as i said in 1942 when you were 13 you weren't a good player it's not like today where you have Nihal Sarin and Pragananda and Alireza who, who were monsters at 13. Back then, when you were 13, you were 1800. So this is incredible play. Okay, I hope you liked the, the first video in the series on Tigran Petrosyan. Let me know what you think. Uh, we are going to continue next Tuesday. And uh, stay tuned for more chess. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.